I usually have a really long introduction, but today I don't want to do that because I have a lot to say about the passage in question. Uh, so I'm not going to give you a big long story or anything. I want to jump right in. Is that okay? Okay, you can't stop me anyway, so I'm just I'm going for it. So I want to start with just a, a, with a with a simple uh, question. As you look at Psalm 33, uh, it, it, this psalm is all about praising God uh, and living a life of praise to Him. So the question is very simple: How much time do you actually spend praising God, like on a given day? Because I know we come to God with all of our needs, and we have a litany of needs, and he, God, these are all my needs. But, but how much time do you actually spend in his presence just praising him? In fact, here's a challenge uh, that you can think about when you leave today. Uh, the next time you go to God in prayer, uh, just make the whole prayer about praise, that you will not ask for one thing, that you will just praise him. Because this is what David's going to do in this psalm. He's just going to, it's a whole psalm about praising God. So here, here is the main idea of the passage, because there's always an authorial intent of a passage. What is he trying to get across? Here's the, the main concept that David is going to unpack for us as we move through this for two weeks. Uh, he's going to say we, as Christians, uh, should praise God for two things. Number one, who God is, and number two, what God does. So what should we do? Praise God for two things, who God is and what God does. And so David's going to say, I've learned these things as I've walked with God, and I want to share them with you. And so he's going to move through this great song about how to praise God, but he's going to motivate you in case you're not really convinced that you should be praising God. So notice what he says in the first three verses. We'll read them. And I, got, I have some words highlighted here. Those are all commands in Hebrew. So a command is not a suggestion, right? Right? So if if you're a parent, you understand when you give your children dictates, those are not suggestions. So if you say curfew is 10 o'clock, are you saying one? You have no children? Yeah. So notice the commands here. These are not suggestions. So if you want to grow up in God and mature in him, you should live a life of rejoicing. So let's read. So what should we do? So first command, rejoice in the Lord. Who should be doing the rejoicing? Well, the righteous should be. We'll come back and talk about that in a minute. For praise from the upright is, a, is what? It's beautiful to watch people praise God. So if you've ever been in, like, I've been there, uh, Chris Tomlin concert. I was at a Chris Tomlin concert in Disneyland one time. The whole thing was like Christian night, and he did a big concert. Just to stand there with people, like, at 9 to 10 o'clock at night, praising God is a what? It's a beautiful thing. He says, praise the Lord uh, with uh, what kind of instrument? Harp. Uh, probably that's their version of a, like a Stratocaster. Uh, make melody to him with an instrument of 10 strings. Uh, sing to him a new song and play skillfully to him with a shout of depression, joy. Yeah, now you have mask on, so I can't see if you're smiling. If you are not smiling, you're, you're not listening to me yet. You, he, he, he's talking about smile. Thank you. You're pulling your mask down. Thank you. You're so obedient. So uh, we want to just come back and look at these. So a Christian that's maturing should, should realize that God's telling you, you should be uh, making great joy before my throne, do you? So let's, let's look at a couple of these, uh, these commands before we actually get into the passage itself. So he says, number one, rejoice in the Lord. And he says, who should do it? He said, it should be the righteous who do this. The word for righteous, sadakim uh, in Hebrew, the plural version, to, to be sadiq or to be righteous means that you are... Um, living according to an ethical norm. But Sadiq, righteous, means the ethical norm is God. He's the standard of measurement, not me. God is. So my life conforms to his. As my life conforms to what he says, I am then righteous. Remember that great group, the Righteous Brothers. Yeah, was it a Christian group? I think not. But didn't they have a great name? The righteous brothers, yeah. What do they mean? Well, I don't know what they were thinking about, but if, you're, if you are the righteous brother or sister in Christ, you're really saying, I'm a person who conforms my life to the norm of God. And I'm the kind of person that should be uh, rejoicing because God's given me clarity as to how to live. Number two, uh, he says, praise the Lord with what? With a harp. Have you, anybody here play a harp? Have you ever seen a harp played in person? It's, it's an awesome thing. At my last church, we knew a harpist. So uh, sometimes around Christmas, we'd, we would uh, we'd hire her to come play for different venues, and she would haul this huge thing in on a roller and set it all up, and it was just beautiful. I would sit and watch her and think, how do you do that? You know, all the strings, and how do you know what to hit, to hit and everything? He says, if you play a harp, uh, do that and, and praise, praise God with that, which translates in our perspective, we could say like the heart is basically like a really good Gibson guitar. Gibson? Did anybody play the guitar here, by the way? 
Yeah. So he says, you know, if you play a really good guitar, just use that, you know, for yourself, but also use your instrument uh, to play for God, to, wor to worship God. Um, he says, uh, in addition to that, make a beautiful melody to him, as opposed to a what? A bad melody. <laughs> yeah, a bad, a bad melody, meaning you're not playing all the notes correctly. So it, you can imagine if, if you were going to go, go play before somebody like super famous, uh, like if you were going to go play, if you were a piano player or whatever it was, you're going to play before like the president or something. Uh, w wouldn't you practice? I mean, don't you think you would? No, so I'll just wing it. Uh, no, you would probably practice. I took 10 years of piano that I told you before, uh, 10 years of piano lessons. I wouldn't say I was the best student ever, but I stuck with it. Now I'm glad I did. But um, I only in my lifetime ever went to one recital. One. Why? Because I realized I don't like being on a stage. <laughs> Isn't that funny? Isn't God funny? Oh, you don't like a stage as an introvert? I'll stick you on one for a livelihood. And so, I mean, I got up there the first time with my little sheet music and the auditorium's full of people and I got to sit up there and play my little piece and I'm like, I told my teacher, I will never do that again. And then in my last church, when I planted that church, I, was on, I played the piano for the worship team for about 17 years. And our drummer, by the way, was trained by White Snake. <laughs> Just saying, it was California. Man, could he play. We had an awesome time together. So what does David say? Pra praise God with whatever you know how to praise him with. Uh, so if you are a trombonist, I, took, I played trombone and band when I was younger. Um, if you're a drummer, like whatever it is, just use that for God. So you have to ask yourself, do I? So if you are, have an instrumental ability and you're not yet praising God corporately on our worship team, you should be asking yourself after today, why am I not? And you can't say, well, I just don't like going on the stage. Neither do I. But then God has a sense of humor, does he not? He's not going to stick you on a stage. Maybe he wants you to praise him with your instrument. Think about it. He says, sing to him a new song. So imagine, this was several thousand years ago. So David wrote this song, wrote the lyrics, wrote the music. Uh, uh, you know, they, they sang it. So back then, this was a new song. And, and the people at the temple could have said, uh, no, we like, the, we, we like the old hymns. We don't want David, not this new song. He said, no, this is a good one. Uh, now this is a really old song, and we're still working on it. But from our day and age, it means that there's, there's old songs that used to be new songs, and now they've been replaced many times over. Because um, we, we remember all the old songs, right? Like, pass it on. It only takes a spark to get a fire going. Remember that song? I mean, all those kinds of songs. Uh, Give me oil in my lamp. Do, do you remember these songs? And your kids are going, where are you from? What, are these? what is this? Um, those things, those, those, those songs are like long gone. Um, but he says, you know, occasionally give God a new song. And so our worship team does a great job giving you the old songs. And then sometimes there's a new song and it's like, great, great. Use that to praise God with. And then I like the last part. He says, play skillfully with a shout of joy. Play skillfully. So it means why does our worship team pra practice so much? Because they want to do, this is for God. Who would want to say, well, we're not going to play skillfully. And God will just, he'll just deal with it. No, 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 you want to give God your best. So uh, five commands, he's telling you, as a Christian, as you grow up in your relationship with God, you should know uh, that in rejoicing before God is a major thing. So if I'm called to do this, and it's not, a, it's not a suggestion, it's a command, how do I do it? Well, that's what he's going to tell you. He's going to tell you how to do it. Two things he says you should do. Praise him, God, for his person. Well, who is he? Well, he tells you who he is. Rejoice in who? Who? The Lord, the Lord. And he says this two times. Verse two, praise the Lord with the harp. Uh, now, capital L-O-R-D. It's all capitalized. That's not Adonai, Lord. This is Yahweh, Lord. Uh, this is woven through, uh, throughout this passage. He, he, he refers to God by this name. It, this is by divine inspiration. Why did he pick that name? We've talked about this before. This is one of David's main names when he writes songs for the Lord. So who is the Lord? This is Yahweh. This is the eternal God. This is the God who is outside of time and space, uh, who created time and space. This is a God who's outside of cause and effect, uh, who made all things by the word of his mouth. It's, it's that God. This is the God of Exodus 3.14 when, when Moses told uh, God at the burning bush, I need a name. What is your name when I go to Israel? And God said, my name is simple. It's I am. 
See, God is always in a state of existence. So David says, when you think about praising God, remember the kind of God you're praising. You're praising God who is so great, he created all things in the cosmos that are seen and unseen. He's so powerful. What does that pragmatically mean to me? Well, think about Isaiah 43, verse 2. God says this through the pen of Isaiah. He says that, he's speaking to Israel. He says, when you pass through the waters of, he's speaking of judgment, he says, I will be with you. And through the rivers, they shall not overflow you. When you walk through the fire, you shall not be burned, nor will the flame scorch you. God says, no matter what happens in your life, since I'm the I am, I'll never check out. I'll never look at your life and go, oh, I totally missed that. I was looking the other way. He will never do it. He says, no matter the rivers, the water, the affliction, no matter what, I'll be with you. Uh, last uh, week ago, Friday, I had a surgery, to, uh, cancer surgery on my head. So uh, I think it's the eighth one that I've had, those uh, kinds of surgeries. So I was in there for seven hours last uh, week ago, Friday. So I got to know the surgeon really well, a young lady from San Francisco. She's new here. And, and I'm from California, she's from California. So we connected immediately and began to talk about all kinds of things. And then she wanted to know, what do you do for a living? I'm a gardener. <laughs> No, well, no. I, I pastor a church. And she's like, oh, that's interesting. So I'm going to hang out with her for seven hours as she's doing a couple different surgeries on my, on my temple. Um, and, and so it, when she found out who I was, this opened a huge door. So as she's working on me all throughout the day, she's asking me all kinds of questions. You know, what kind of Bible do you use? What translation do you use? This is the translation I use. Blah, blah, blah. And, and we're just, you know. And at one point she goes, man, I could just talk to you all day and ask you questions. This is awesome. And I'm like, well, pay attention to what you're doing, you know, but, uh, you, you know, so God's taking me through deep water, uh, and, and, and it's not fun going in there, but it's like, okay, this is, God, God's with me in the deep water, and, and, things, and things are good. Um, but uh, later in the day, when she's finally finished, and she's going to suture everything closed, I'm, I got my mask on, I can hardly breathe. They have gauze all around my head, I can't see, and they have a surgical like over my face so that I'm not blinded. And this is why she asked me while she's sewing me up. She's sewing and pulling my head all these different directions, and she says to me, I was just kind of wondering, my next question is, what do you think about transgenderism? <laughs> what do you do at that point? I'm like, well, funny you would ask that. She's like, why? Well, I, I wrote a 400-page dissertation on that for my doctoral degree. She stopped sewing at that point. She's like, you are kidding me. Uh, no. So I said, which do you want? You want the long version or the short version? <laughs> Unbelievable. What was I doing there? God put me there. What did he put me there for? I mean, I could have been complaining, huh? It's the eighth one of these. I don't want to do another one of these. This is not fun. Blah, blah, blah. No, God put me there by his sovereignty so I could talk to the, the surgeon that day, the new surgeon, and to the, the surgical assistant who actually was a Christian and went to another church. I mean, great. I had a great time. You're there to be God's witness and then praise him even for the fact that you're there because he's going to be with you in the deep water. Fire will not overcome you because he sovereignly placed you there. So praise him even in that. Will you do it? Number two, you praise God for who he is and you also praise God for his practice, like what he does. So what does God do? Verse four says, for the word of the Lord is right uh, and all of his work is done in truth. The word, his word is right. Now, what this means, uh, the, the Hebrew word here for right is yashar, uh, and this means to be straight, straight as opposed to crooked. Uh, this became a, a word that was used uh, in moral terms because it was easy to say that which God does is straight, and that which the devil does and in, in people do in sin, well, that's crooked. Um, when you read this in Hebrew, there's no copula there. There's no verb, is. It, it just says, uh, for the word of the Lord right. Could you imagine if you wrote your wife a letter when you're on vacation somewhere and a trip, business trip, you wrote her like an email and you left out the verbs? She's like, you must go to BCC. You're using ellipsis to get my attention. Yes. When you use ellipsis, you leave out the main verb and it makes you really focus on what's being said. So what does he say? God, when I think past your person that I praise you for and I think about your practice, I think about the God who's told me what's morally true versus that which is not morally true. And I praise you because I know the difference between the two. And uh, so what, it, what you think about the Ten Commandments, right? The Ten Commandments. God tells us in the Ten Commandments exactly what he wants from us. 
You know, he, we know exactly what it wants from us, so I know that I should not covet, right? I should not covet. But, but we covet, don't we? But, his, but it says his word is right, so I know that his word tells me morally what I should do and what I not, should not do, so I, I covet. One day I was out shopping with the wife, and this is just a little hint if you're a man shopping with your wife. You get bored, don't you? Like, babe, I'm here for you. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so, you know, I was bored. So I was like, oh, you, you, I don't want to be in the dress section anymore. So I walked over to the shoes, and I'm looking at the shoes, and I'm looking at my really nice shoes, uh, my tennis shoes, and, and I'm thinking they're all good. And then I took a new pair of tennis shoes, and I set them next to mine. What happens at that point? I coveted those. So by the time Liz comes over there to me, she's like, how you doing? I need me a pair of those. You know, I mean, it's like, uh, my those were fine. But so the, coveting can hit you at, at so quickly. Uh, should I steal from someone? No. Because the, the scriptures tell me, no, thou shalt not steal. And it doesn't leave you room for, well, you can in some situations. No, it's, it's definitive. So God's word is right. He tells us exactly what we are to do. Any deviation of that is sin. So I can praise him because I know exactly what he wants me to do. And when I do it, I'm happy. My culture says, all love is love. True? Not true. Because I know from the scriptures that are true, if the object of my love is not what God prescribed in his scriptures, then that love's not love, it's a deception. Then I must, I must move away from that. And so we have to be very careful as we praise God to realize your word tells me what I'm supposed to do, what I'm not supposed to do, and I praise you for, for telling me the path to take. Um, I don't know how you feel about Ikea. Do you like Ikea? Not that I work for him. Uh, have you ever purchased anything from Ikea? Yeah. Uh, well, I always, it's a staff joke that Marty's, you know, he's not pro-Ikea. I bit the dust the other day. I really did. I, um, I had a section in my, uh, we have like a, like a craft room added onto the back of the house. Really nice vaulted ceiling, really pretty. Uh, and there was a section in there uh, that was just shelving. And so I, I, I demoed that whole section out, and I ordered two cabinets with really nice uh, Quaker doors uh, for that section, and I, and, I, and I screwed them together. And then I had to build a frame around it so it looked like a built-in. Then I had to build a frame for the bottom to set it on, and then all I had to fit within a certain you know, area. So that was my weekend project after I had surgery. That was fun. Do you think I eyeballed it? Do you do that? It looks good to me. No, no, I didn't eyeball it, because once I got every, I got the frame built, screwed to the floor, got all, everything built in, I put the cabinets in there, everything, it all fits. And I step back, and I'm like, man, that looks pretty good. I'm not even a carpenter, but that looks pretty good. Then I went out in the garage, and I got my level, because I'm about to screw it to the back wall. What do you think my level, level told me? <laughs> you got some work to do. And I put it on one side, and I'm like, man, that's a couple degrees off. That, I can't handle that. I'm type A. I could never go back there into the pantry. That's off by a few degrees. It freaked me out. So I got to push the whole cabinet that way. And so when I pushed it that way, th but I then got to push it back to screw it to the wall, then it's off the other way. That's when you just set your level down. I'm just screwing it to the wall. No. That's when you realize it's crooked. Therefore, I got to fix it. So I have to call in backup, somebody else to hold the cabinet while I screw it with the, uh, with the DeWalt drill, etc. all that kind of stuff. So when it says the word of the Lord is right, I may not like it at times because sin times sometimes seems sweet, but I know when I do the sin, it's not sweet. It's sour. Uh, but I know when I, when I acquiesce and I, uh, I yield to God, well, that's sweet. And that's why David says the word of the Lord is right. So our, our culture is crooked, totally crooked. So our culture calls that which is straight crooked. Uh, and they do this because they don't believe in moral absolutes anymore. Everything's relative. Everybody just does that which is right in their own eyes, and truth is truth. There's no truth, there's truths. There's no absolute truth, it's just opinions. It's just preferences. But the whole system, which our school systems have taught us, and, and all through the media, is that uh, relativism is the, is the way to look at truth today. Well, no, it doesn't. Because we know, as Christians, that God is the absolute truth, and his morals that he communicates never change. So I'm going to just share with you uh, seven basic flaws of relativistic thinking, because it's contrary to what God says through David's pen. And if you buy into relativism, you're not going to praise God much, because you're going to chafe against his morals. But David says, praise God for being morally straight and teaching you. But the, our culture says the opposite. Truth is relative to the person. Do your own thing. Flaws of the system. Now, we'll click down through them. Number one, if you're a relativist. Flaw number one, relativists, they can't accuse others of wrongdoing. Why? 
everything's relative. My version of truth is okay, so is yours, even if they're diametrically opposed. I can't say you're guilty of wrongdoing. You can't, hey, it's cool, man. We're all okay. They can't do that. Number two, relativists, they can't complain about the problem of evil. Why? Because if we're all just doing our version of truth, there can't, by definition, be evil because we're all doing what we want to do. So you couldn't condemn somebody for evil, but they do. Number three, relativists, they can't blame uh, or can't, can't place blame or accept praise. Why? Because there's no absolute truth to measure it by. Four, relativists, they can't make uh, changes uh, or charges of unfairness of injustice, which they do all the time. Why can't they do that? Well, because they have no absolute standard to know what's fair and unjust. Psalm uh, 33, verse 5, uh, at the end, we'll get there in a few minutes, says the Lord loves two things, righteousness and justice. He's the standard of both those things. A relativist can't say that. Five, relativists can't improve on their morality. They can't improve. Why? Because they've all arrived in their system. Because the way I view morality for me, and the way they might view morality, they might be diametrically opposed, but neither one of us could improve because we are exactly what we want to be. Six, relativists can't hold meaningful moral discussions. Why? What's there to talk about? If I'm doing what I want to do and you're doing what you want to do, we can have no moral discussion. There's no absolute truth. Uh, and seven, relativists can't promote the obligation of tolerance. Why? Because there's no absolute standard by which to gauge tolerance. We just all kind of move through life, uh, you know, and then they eventually become intolerant of those who are absolutist. What does God say? Because that, by the way, leads to absolute moral chaos to a culture, which is what's happening to our country. They've abandoned God in absolutes. And David says, no, God, your word is true. Your word is right. It's morally true. The culture that abides by relativism heads into total disarray. And what's the solution? Is, is, well, the solution is praising God for being morally straight and, and aligning your life with him. That's, that's where a happy person is. So when God tells me thou shalt not and I don't do it, it breeds happiness in my life. You praise him for being morally straight. Number two, we praise God because uh, he is uh, absolutely one who loves righteousness and justice. He loves those two things, righteousness and justice. They are all about his, his character. What is righteousness? It is living according to a norm tied to God. So anything from Genesis to Revelation that he says by way of command is what God says. This is my law. Live by this and you will be happy and blessed. Uh, to not live that way, you're not going to be happy and blessed. So what's missing in our world today? The love of righteousness, living according to God's norm, and justice. In fact, when you throw out righteousness, you just threw out justice. How so? If I think my race is better than another race, is that righteous? Is it righteous? No. Because what did God say? I created you all equal in my eyes, right? Right? We are all equal in, in the eyes of God. No race is greater than the other race. And as we see ourselves as equal, that leads to righteous thinking. But if I say, no, my race is better than your race, which some in our culture unfortunately do, then what happens? Injustice follows. See, God is so smart. He says, if you embrace righteous living by what I say you should do, then by definition, if so facto, in, in addition to righteousness, you, get, you automatically get justice. You get justice. So the, our, our culture, our, our schools, our state, our politicians, etc., they're, they're constantly f forgetting what true righteousness is. It's related to who God is and what God has said. And when they follow what God has said in the scriptures, it breeds, it breeds justice in a nation. Psalm 89, uh, verse 14, uh, tells us that these concepts of righteousness and of justice, they're the bedrock of the throne of God. Notice what it says in verse 14. It says, righteousness and justice are the foundation of your throne. Mercy and truth go before your face. Psalm 89, uh, we're in Psalm, what? 33, Psalm 89. We will get there one day, Lord willing. Psalm 89 is a, is a messianic psalm about the coming of the Messiah to rule and reign over the earth from Jerusalem as prophesied in the prophets. I mean, Psalm, uh, Isaiah 2 is a great passage about the throne of the Messiah set up in Jerusalem. He will rule and reign over the earth. And we saw back in Psalm 2, he will rule and reign uh, and create peace when he arrives. So in Psalm 89, verse 14, 
uh, the psalmist says that when the Messiah appears at the end of the tribulation in the second coming, when he appears and you see his throne in Jerusalem, it's founded on two things. What does he say? Righteousness measured against himself and justice. I mean, think about the practical application of that. That means when Jesus appears, right living is going to replace, replace wrong living. That means moral people are going to replace immoral people. Godly people will replace godless people. The, the last and the first will trade. Uh, the meek will replace the fierce and the arrogant. The peacemakers will replace the warmongers. The spiritual belief that's true will replace that which is you know, false. I mean, on and on it goes. That when the Messiah appears, righteousness, right living appears, followed by great justice. Can you vote these two things in? No, you cannot. You cannot. They will come when Jesus appears. But what do we do in the meantime? Well, I know the king is coming, and I praise him for being righteous and just. But in the meantime, let me give you some ideas what you should be doing. Number one, wrong living. That you know what is wrong because the Spirit of God's telling you that's wrong. Wrong living should be replaced by right living. God, I am not doing what I need to do. Some people would say, you know, the way I train my son is I make it really hard on him and I provoke him quite often to make him a man. Really? What does Paul say in Ephesians 6 verses 1 and 2? He tells you there if you want to read it as a parent, do not provoke your children. Do not. This is ungodly. And so when, you, when the Spirit of God taps you on the shoulder, when you hear the word, the right way to go, and you acquiesce to that, then you just traded wrong living for right living and God's face shines upon you. May we be the kind of people that when we hear the God speak to us, then we make some radical change. Number two, injustice should be rooted out of your life at all cost. Injustice. That when you see something in your life that's not just, that you, you make a change about it. And you, you make it quickly. Uh, when I was in college, I've told you before, I did different odd jobs in addition to being a gardener. But I also sold boats in L.A. Because my roommate's dad owned the largest boat dealership in L.A. I didn't know anything about boats. I was like 19 years old, and my roommate came to me one, when we were uh, sophomores, and he said, hey, you want to make some good money, uh, and we'll train you how to sell boats, and we're here to read all these books, and great commissions. I'm like, great? And so I was sitting there selling boats, having never driven one. I knew all the specs about, you know, how fast they would sink, you know, how great the engine was, etc. I knew all the, the specs. But I also understood that this was before computers, when you were selling one, and you were getting, the thing was, if you got the person into the boat, you could usually close the deal. Don't you like the leather, feel the teak wood, et cetera? Can't you imagine yourself behind this, et cetera? So you would go into the back room. There was a filing system of all the boats that we had, a couple acres of boats. And you could pull out the boat in question, and you could see how much the dealership was into that boat. And then you could then calculate what kind of commission that you wanted on that. I work with a bunch of non-Christian people. Believe me, they had a lot of liberty with the percentages they made. I didn't function like that because I'm not into injustice. So what I did as a Christian there is I just started telling them the truth. <laughs> this is interesting. You know, these guys, I'm like 19. These guys are like 40, 40 years old, these salesmen. And so pretty soon out back we had all these old boats. No one would sell them because they didn't like the commission. I sold like almost all the old boats. Because they were like, I want a bigger commission on the boats up front. And I'm like, well, what about the ones around the side? So I just started selling each one of them. And I would tell the people, well, if you take that at New Newport Beach, you might last on the ocean about one hour. You know, don't take it in the ocean. Take it to a lake. You know, it's a little better. So I would, I would tell them all the specs. And so I started selling all the old boats. So one day, I was sitting in the showroom with all the big boats. Uh, and it was my up. So your up means it's your turn. Whoever comes in next, you're on. So we're all sitting there, salesmen in our chairs. Guy pulls up in a black turbo Carrera. I'm thinking, whoa. If you're a salesman, what are you thinking? Cha-ching, I'm going to be able to pay tuition off this semester. So the guy pulls in black turbo Carrera, gets out in a suit, comes in, and, and they, the other salesmen look at me, and they're like, Marty, it's your turn. I'm like, praise God. I am closing this deal. You know, so the guy came in and started talking to him. We've we got a huge, you know, deep sea boats in, this, in, the, in the showroom. And you close one of those things, and I mean, it will pay for tuition off for the whole year. I'm like, oh, this is awesome. Uh, and so I start talking to this guy, and I'm telling him all about one of our big boats, and I'm thinking, he could totally afford this. He says, great. 
And then the guy looked at me as we were inside the boat talking, and he, this is what he asked me. He goes, hey, young man, do you do this for a living? Uh, no. Uh, what's, what do you think his next question was? What do you do? Well, I'm a student. Where are you a student? This guy was the DA of L.A. That's who he was. I'm like scared to death after he told me who he was. Um, he, he's like, where do you go to school? Uh, Azusa Pacific University. Oh, well, yeah, I know that school. What are you studying there? Um, I'm studying uh, theology, you know, major in Old Testament. Well, that's interesting. Uh, he said, well, what do you think about God? Well, I think a lot of things about God. He goes, well, so do I. I'm a Jehovah's Witness. <laughs> sell, no sell. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? I mean, all of a sudden, I'm watching this thing go before my eyes. Do you know what I'm saying? Like, do I engage him? And all the other salesmen are sitting in their chairs listening to us because you could hear everything in the sales room. And they're hearing this whole conversation because I can see them. They're watching me like hawks. And um, so, the, the, so, so we start this huge theological discussion in this boat. And I'm like, well, you know, I believe that Jesus is Jehovah God. Well, I don't believe Jesus is Jehovah God. Well, I just believe Jesus is a God. Well, I believe he's the God. And here's the reasons why. I mean, we had this huge Huge theological discussion. And eventually, uh, you know, I told him, I'll pray for you. And he leaves and gets in his turbo Carrera and leaves. Head salesman comes over to me. Can I talk to you? I'm like, yeah, what, what's, what about, about? Never do that again. N never do what? You just lost a major sale. What are you thinking about? I said, you know, I would rather lose a sale if that guy were to find Christ and end up in eternity seeing him face to face. It's better than the commission of the boat. So I said, the next time someone comes in like that, I'll tell them about Jesus. And then God gave me bless. He blessed me. I could have been unjust, right? I could have, I could have said, oh, man, the guy's a turbo Carrera. I went back, checked the price of the boat. I could have jacked it up and all that kind of stuff. I didn't do that. Why? I was Christian. And so God took care of me. And what does David say? He said, hey, praise God with your life. Realize he's the standard of measurement for what is moral and live in such a way that your life is full of justice. Uh, give God praise for being that righteous God of justice. Do it. And then lastly, despite how function, dysfunctional our world is, how devious it is, etc. Uh, notice what David says at the end of this uh, little pericope here. Verse 5, what does he say? He says, the, the earth is full of what? The goodness, do you see this? The earth is full of the goodness of who? L-O-R-D, Yahweh, the eternal God. The earth is full. Would you say that the earth is full of the goodness of God right now? Yeah. It's what, it's the devil hates it. What does the word goodness mean in Hebrew? It's the word hesed. C-H-E-S-E-D. What does it mean? It means loyal love. It means you cannot break my grip of love on you. It means no matter what happens, I will not fail to love you. So, so no matter how dysfunctional my society becomes, re rejecting God and his norm of morality, I know that woven through the thread of my culture is the loyal love of God that he will never let us go as his people. Remember the old song, his eyes on the sparrow? Truly it is. His eye is always, if it, his eyes on a little sparrow, his eye most certainly is on you because Jesus said, are you not worth much more than they? That's the lo loyal love of Christ. So when you think about praising God, think about who he is, and then pause and consider what he has done. And I challenge you sometime today when you sit down with God in prayer, just tell him, God, for the next however many minutes, I'm not going to ask you for one thing. I'm only going to tell you the things I praise you for. That's what we're created for. Let's pray. God, thank you. Uh, David's pen challenges us in so many ways. And I'm sure he lived through all of this himself. And he's just sharing with us from a life full of praising you. Might we learn from him? to be specific when we praise you. And may our lives reflect uh, who you are. And may we not be afraid of who you are, but it, it, it relish every moment the fact that you are with us in all aspects of life. And we are called to be those who reflect your image to those about us in a joyous way. Amen.